And there she is, the Crystal Bach, the newest boat on the river. Crystal went into the river boat business a little over a year ago, which they bought an old ship and totally renovated it and called it the Mozart. And that was the first ship that Pat and I got on and went on a cruise, 16 day cruise from Vienna to Vienna and had a very great time. This year, Crystal introduced four more brand new boats. This one you see here called the Buck and there's the a Debussy, the Ravel, and the Molha. Well, yeah, I guess you can see that Crystal just likes to name their ships after the Renaissance composers. You know, Pat, it's getting kind of warm up here. Why don't you change it to something more comfortable? Oh, that's a good idea. Yes, of course. Is this quick enough? Well, I guess it is. I think you're doing this better and better. All right. Hey, Pat, are you enjoying the scenery there as you're looking at? Yes, that's very interesting. And that whirlwind of, of letters up there. Oh, good. I'm glad you like that. Pat, stop. Move back a step. A little more. Okay. Now watch what's going to happen in front of you. Oh, my goodness. You almost killed me. No, I didn't almost kill you. Yes, you did. I might have bruised you a little bit, but I didn't almost kill you. Well, thanks. That thing would have never touched you. I doubt that. Oh, believe it. I, you're in good hands. That would have never, never hit you. It vaporized. It's gone. Our first stop is to the windmill village of Sanzi Sans with its authentic crafts and houses from the 18th and 19th centuries. Outside of the building is decorated with all the little wooden shoes that were made inside. In this next view, we see a wooden shoe that has just been put on the lathe and hollowed out. Now we go through some examples in the museum. First of all, we see the highly decorative shoes and the exotic shoes. Here are the humorous shoes and you see the set of teeth staring at you. And the, the painted shoes and the shoes on roller skates. And these are the shoes for sale. And here are my shoes. See the super size? We're now going to move over to the windmill section. They have three windmills here. And what's remarkable about these windmills is they are working windmills. These are sawmills. They cut logs into planks of lumber, which you see over here and so on. Then from here, it's got to go to a regular sawmill to be cut into whatever would they want to. But the remarkable thing about it is this mill was destroyed during the Second World War. And um, they found um, plans from the 17th century of how this mill was built. And what they did is they reconstructed it and rebuilt it completely. And it has no nails in it. It is all put together with wooden dowels. Now we're going to take you inside and show you how this windmill works. Here they're lifting a log into place. This log is about 25 to 30 feet long and they put it down in place and secure it so they can go ahead to the next step. Here, you're seeing here the saw blades going up and down and this space exactly for the size of the planks they want to cut. Now there's another one over to the left that's going up and down and there's still a third one over here where we're standing. But for this demonstration they're only doing one log for us. Actually they can do three logs at once. So you see that it's really quite a production. And to cut a log all the way through, it takes anywhere from one 
an hour and a half to two hours, depending on how long the logs are. So you can see, you can see it's not a speedy operation. Here's another view showing you how the log is going in there and moving forward. Now this is the wheel that controls the speed of the log moving forward. As you can see, it's moving one notch at a time. And as long as it keeps going or pulling one notch at a time, the log will go through. As I said, it takes anywhere from an hour and a half to two hours to cut a log completely. The sawdust is collected underneath, and you can see there's quite a pile of wood here. So I asked, what do you do with this sawdust? Do you sell it or do you make another product out of it? And they said, no, what we do with it is give it to the local farmers here. They use it for bedding for their animals. After leaving the windmills, we walked down the canal over here and went into a nice little cafe, but right on the bank of the canal, to where they served us coffee or tea and a piece of uh, Holland pastry, which was very, very good. As you can see, we're here having a good time on the banks of the canal and enjoying our refreshments. In the city of Antwerp, we are headed from the ship toward the old city of Antwerp. And we go down a tiny alley where there is a in very inconspicuous little door, which leads us to into the old town of Antwerp. We now find ourselves in the market square of Old Antwerp, surrounded by these gorgeous market buildings. Right in the middle of the market square, we find on the ground this little boy and his dog sleeping on the ground. The statuary is very unusual because it tells the story of this homeless little boy that would come down to the square every day. He would meet his dog down there and the dog would stay with him and at night time the dog slept with him to keep him nice and warm. In the town square we've come across this mannequin in front of the lace store and we see the examples of lace that are there to be purchased. From the marketplace we catch our first glimpse of the steeple of the Cathedral of Our Lady. Inside this Gothic edifice you will find some of the world's greatest Rubens paintings, including the elevation of the cross and descent from the cross. Our next point of interest is the beautiful stained glass windows and carved woodwork that surround us in the church. Having left the cathedral, we progressed onto the house where Peter Paul Rubens lived and worked till his death in 1640. Even from the outside, it's palatial and inside is a, a whole household full of magnificent original paintings by Rubens. Today is a day of sailing on the river, so this is an opportunity for me to show you some more of this ship. Now here we are entering the dining room, and we're walking down this side, and looking down through this, what the dining room looks like. As you can see, it's really quite elaborate. You got tables for two, tables for six, tables for fours. They can accommodate just about any size group that you want. They also serve breakfast and lunch up here. And Pat and I normally sit over here at the end because it's right next to the buffet line, which is right behind the wall. And then uh, it makes it very convenient for us to have our breakfast here. And uh, now we're gonna continue on 
and show you the rest of the place what it looks like which is the same as what the other side except that it goes up the other end of the dining room and over here they on the right hand side they got tables for twos all the way along and of, of, again over here you can go anywhere you like But this is our room. This is the bed and right next to the bed is a big huge window that's about seven foot long by four foot high and which is right behind these drapes over here. And this is very interesting because I'm going to show you now what it really is. You know Pat, this is a very novel window that I've never seen in any other ship other than this one. Well, it is certainly unique. Show me how it works. You want to see it work? Yes. Okay. Let's you, see you work it. I'll show you how it works. You come over here and you press the button. Okay. And look what happened. Oh my gosh. The window is coming down. You know what? It's going to open up Fresh all air. the way down. Fresh air. Look at the fresh air you're going to get. We can jump right out the window and... Oh yeah, the water's just there. <laughs> I don't know how you would get back up again. There <laughs> you go. That's quite a contraption. <clears throat> See that? Now it's all stopped all by Pretty. itself. Now, it's if you, gorgeous. If you're afraid of bugs or something, Come over here and you press the other button. Oh my. And look what comes down. You can't have a bird fly into the cabin. Huh? A screen. You can't have the birds come in. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? That is magic. That is really a, a novel thing. I've never seen this on a ship before. No, I haven't either. Well, that's, that's well, interesting. This is a brand new ship. And now we have fresh air but screened. And it's great when you're around on the other side, it keeps a little of the sun out too. It screens. At the foot of the of bed screens. is a nice little desk with a little seat to sit in over here and a little table so you can put your bottle of wine, glass of wine and sit down and relax. Then this is the bathroom. Very, it's tight, but it's very nice and functional. Beautiful, with a beautiful shower. And this is the door that leads out into the hallway. At the end of the hallway, up one deck, is the spa. And this is it here, which is at the very re rear of the ship. And there's also a nice little pool up there. And you can step out the back door over here and sit on the back deck and enjoy view and this is right as you're going along. The pool is really quite nice, nice and warm. So this is really a very beautiful place to spend some time if you want to relax, get a massage or what, anything else that you may want to have. Now if you go back down to the deck we were originally and look down and you see how long these hallways are. So you like to try and get a room close to midship as possible. So you should book your voyage at least six, seven, eight months ahead of time so that you don't wind up way back here in the end of the ship. Now right here in midship is the glass elevator that takes you up one deck to the bistro area. So you see here comes the elevator, the door is going to open and Pat and I are going to get into it. I'm going to come in there with you. Now this elevator is big enough for two of us but I don't know if it's big enough for two of us plus our camera. We're going to find out in a minute. We're now in the bistro area. This is where you can get very light food if you want to, and uh, for any one of the three meals. You don't even have to, you can have a light, very light dinner up here also if you like. We're now entering the lounge. This is where 
they have entertainment at night and during the daytime if you want you can sit in here read or do whatever you you enjoy doing or if you just want to sit and have a drink the waiter will bring you one right to your table now if you don't want to sit at the table you can sit at the bar which is at the other end of the lounge over here and uh, enjoy yourself this very lovely port side that you see is where we are located on the fifth day of our journey, which is Cologne. This creates a very welcoming sight. The earliest view of a UNESCO World Heritage Site located in Cologne is of the Cathedral of St. Martin. The side view of St. Martin's shows some very interesting details of this church and we also see that they are working on the church cleaning it piece by piece. During the Second World War these two church steeples which stood at a height of 515 feet were being used by the Allies as landmarks so they could navigate to wherever they were going. As a result, the, the city was flattened, but the church remained untouched to this day, and it has remained Northern Europe's largest Gothic church and a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And now we'll go inside the cathedral and view the expansive interiors and the magnificent windows. Here we show two views of the very extensive organ pipes and two very elaborate side altars. We now leave in the church and walk in the streets to the Old Market Square of Cologne. Now, first of all, notice these beautiful streets that we're walking on, cobblestone streets. I've had enough cobblestone streets to last me for a lifetime. And now we're in the Market Square where we see the fountain and the very old original buildings, very highly decorated which were spared from the bombings of World War II. Here are close-ups of these highly decorated buildings that we see along the square. And now you're looking at other streets that lead in and out of the square. Even though it is mid-afternoon on the Thursday, there is a surprisingly very large group of people sitting here drinking beer and listening to the music. On day six, we headed down the Mosul River toward the village of Kocham, where along the way we see lots and lots of vineyards and wine tasting cellars. This area is along adjacent to the upper middle Rhine Valley, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Along the way, we also see a few of the ancient ruins of castle, defense castles, actually. They looked around, I saw this house up high in the hill, all secluded by itself. And there's another one not too far away from it. And then uh, from that one, we're looking down into the village itself, this, where I'm going next. And in the village here, there's also another church, pretty close to the one you saw just before this. 
I am now up on a hill looking down on this lovely village over here. And you can see it's pretty well spread out pretty nice. Why am I up here? Because the next thing we're going to do is look at this beautiful castle coming up right here. The name of this castle is Reichsberg Castle, the cream of the Moselle River. This mosaic on the tower caught my attention. I gave it a real good close-up. This mosaic depicts the photo of St. Christopher helping the little boy cross the waterway. We're now in the walkway, just outside the castle, and to when we walk through this archway, we'll be entering a courtyard. And I took out just a few pictures of the surrounding building with the interesting rooftop, just to show you how interesting this place really is. The first room that we enter as we went into the castle is this dining room. As you can see, it's a beautiful dining room, nicely set up. And at the end of the room here, there's this credenza displaying all the beautiful china that they have. Sitting on top of the credenza is this wood carving piece, which is very, very intricate and very, very elaborate. There's a lot of other pieces on the wall which are very interesting, like this one over here. And there's another one coming up shortly, which is just as nice, if not nicer. They really love to do fancy wood carving. And you have to admit, it is a very beautiful carved timber ceiling. We also see a very beautiful painting on top of some very interesting hand-painted wallpaper. And what we have we here? It's an angel holding a candle, and this is known as a fertility angel. It's for you women primarily. If you want to walk by it and you rub her tummy, she will make you fertile. And now we're entering the game room. These people back in those days were great hunters and they loved to bring home their prizes and mount them on a wall and admire them. And you can admit here, they got quite a, a, an elaborate assortment of them. And now, uh, you know, this is what they love to do and they love to show them off. Just look at this lovely wrought iron inch. I've never seen anything quite like it before. We're now in a room where they're displaying suits of armor. And if you were here and looked at these suits, you would know that the people that wore these were only about five foot tall. But of course, there was always an exception to the rule. This guy was seven foot. Now we're moving outside in the courtyard to where we're gonna have some refreshments and some entertainment. And I'm gonna show you some of this building in the meantime to show you how pretty this place is. This gentleman, all dressed up in the clothing that people wore back in the 16th and 1700s, came out to lecture us and give us some information about how life was in this place during that period in time. He also brought with him this gentleman with the mandolin who is going to be entertaining us with music and song. So pay attention to these shoes that he's wearing. You have to admit they're very, very null. Sie 
hat zwei rote Wengelein. Ja, ja, Wengelein sind größer als der Wein. Well, that's the end of our tour of this beautiful palace. And from that courtyard, I, this is the final look at this beautiful view of the Moselle River. This morning, we're going to walk right by foot from the ship to the cable car station, to where we're going to enjoy a scenic ride by cable car to visit the uh, Ruder Times iconic Niederwald monument. Hang on, Pat. Here we go. And up, up, and away. While we're ascending, you will enjoy the magnificent views of the Upper Middle Rhine Valley, which is named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And you'll see the picturesque landscape of terrace vineyards, forest-clad hills, and green river isles. Built in the late 19th century, following the Franco-Prussian War, is the Niederwall Monument, which stands as a tribute to German nationalism. At the base of the monument, you see statues that are decorating the base. There are two winged creatures on either side of the base with a center feature. At the top of the monument is the imposing statue of Germania, who stands for German nationalism. From up here, we're looking down at the city of Mainz, where we have another trip this afternoon. And by the way, Mainz is on both sides of the river. The river cuts right through the middle of Mainz. And off to the right, down the little ways, is a village called Bad Kreuznach. This to me is important to me because I, when I was in a service, I spent two years of my life there. And we'll talk about that later. We're now off the cable car and walking down this quaint little street of Rudersheim to our next destination, which is this little outdoor cafe that you see over here. Of course, they serve a specialty drink there. It's called Rudersheim Coffee. This lady wheeled this cart here, which has got large uh, ceramic mugs, which you have to hold with two hands. And she puts brandy in the bottom, then coffee, and then whipped cream on top of that. And then finishes off the whole thing with nutmeg on top, as you see here. And boy, is this stuff good. city of Mainz, we headed towards St. Stephen's Church, where we will view the famous Chagall windows, done by the renowned artist Marc Chagall. The blue light from these windows show angels and other biblical figures seemingly move ethereally in this light. After we have viewed these beautifully decorated windows, we sit down for an exclusive organ recital.
after spending the afternoon enjoying those beautiful Chagall windows and the organ recital, we headed back through town what, looking at the half timbered buildings all the way back to our ship. Since many of these homes were built before the unification of a written language, many of them were designated, each different family, by their own shield, in this case a duck, or statuary. You notice some of these buildings are wider and others are narrower. Well, there's a good reason for it. Because they charge taxes by the amount of windows on the front of the building, a lot of people kept their building to just two windows wide. But the people who were wealthier and had more money built the buildings with three or four windows in front of it. On our way back to the ship, we walked through the city and noticed the uh, fancy architecture and all this stuff. And the one thing that really was, made a, an impression was they had a row of original gas lights. Before I show you the next segment, I'm going to have to give you a little explanation as to why it's even in, going to be in this video. This morning when we were up at the monument, I said that 65 years ago when I was in the service, I was stationed just a short way from here in a town called Bite Kreuznach. Then the guide said to me, he said, oh yeah, that's just up the river a little ways. It's very close to here. I said, fine. Then that afternoon, when we went on the other tour, which uh, when, that was the church with the whole organ recital, I talked to that guy quite a bit on the way back, and he was very knowledgeable about this area. And I told him about where I was stationed and by Kreuznach there, and he said, oh yeah, I know that complex very well. He says, it's still there to this day except nowadays it's uh, occupied by the German military. I was like, great, great. And I also told him, so, yeah, when I was in that compound there, we um, had a very good photo lab, and uh, we had a German civilian who was running it. And uh, one day he took me and two other guys out to this deserted castle uh, right on the banks of the Rhine. He said, oh yes, that's still there to this day. I said, well, at that time when I was there, it was abandoned and deserted. He says, yep, it still is. It has never been occupied over all these years. It is slowly slipping into decay and ruins. I said, oh, that's a shame. He said, yeah, but the young German kids still use it nowadays. They use it as lover's lane. Hmm, good, I'm glad they found a use for it. This is the compound where I was stationed. This was division headquarters for the 7th Armored Division. In case you don't remember who the 7th Armored Division was, it was General Patton's old outfit during the Second World War. General Patton and his tanks went charging through Europe and was given credit for shortening the war. Well, this is where I spent two years of my life. This is the vehicle that I was assigned to. It's called a half track. If you look at the rear of this thing, you can just about see. That's because it has a tank treads in the back and a steering wheel in the front. This thing had no power assist at all of any kind. No power brakes, but then again, you know, when you weigh between seven tons and seven and nine tons, who needs brakes? You just roll over what's in front of you. And also no power steering. You hung on to that steering for their life and used nothing more than human power. That thing you see just above my windshield, that's a uh, camouflage nuts. All the vehicles can use camouflage nuts, which was a necessity to have. And that other thing you see sticking up there with a cover on it, that's a 50 caliber machine gun on a ring mount. This was the Second World War version of an armored personnel carrier. And this was my vehicle for 14 months. I'm not back at the compound because I was reassigned to be the Colonel's 
uh, official driver. So I gave up my half track for one of these sedans that you see parked down over here. And then my job was in the morning, I went to his barracks, his quarters, picked them up and brought him here and then sat and waited to see if he wanted to go anywhere. If not, then I took him to lunch. But that wasn't so bad because he ate at the officers club and I also got to eat there. The food there was much, much better than what it was here in our mess over here. Then at night I used to pick him up and then take him back to his quarters and that was it for the day. Now you know, this is supposed to be a prestige job. Well, it was the most boringest thing that I ever did in my life. Well, I told you about the Photoshop that was located over here. And um, now I'll tell you a little something about it. Uh, I spent quite a lot of time in that shop doing a lot of photography stuff, stuff like developing my own film, making enlargements, making prints, so forth and so on. And uh, one day I went to the, uh, the German civilian who was operating the shop and I said to him, I said, um, Klaus, I would like to make a self-portrait of myself. Would you help me set it up and take the picture for me? And he said, of course I will. No problem at all. And you'll see what we came up with. Now, I don't know if you're ready for this or not, but this is what I looked like 65 years ago at age 22. Now, my wife never, never liked this picture. She thought it was terrible. But my girlfriend Flo and Pat over here have different ideas about it. They seem to like it. Wow, this handsome young fellow looks exactly like a French resistance fighter. So prevalent back at that time. Well, that's enough about me. So let's move on to the castle on the Rhine. This is that old deserted uh, castle on the Rhine. As you can see, it's across the river and the only way we could get up to it was to rent a rowboat and row out to it. This is another view of it. And, and it, it looks like it's on an island, but it really is not. That ground that it's on is attached to the mainland behind it. Well, we got into the palace and what What's the first thing you do when you're 22 years old? You run around as fast as you can and try to see as much as possible and climb up to the highest point you possibly can and see what you can see from up there. So I got all the way up to the top and found this little opening looking out and this really was a pretty good view and I really liked what I saw. And so I looked around some more to see if there was anything else and I did find something else. On the other side, there was another opening that I could look out and I looked out there nice and this is what I found. Another great view. And look at what I found here. We're not alone. Some guy in a canoe came rowing out there, same thing the way we did and he's also coming in to look around. Now, another thing that that guy told me in mind, he said, you know, when your boat leaves this after, later on this afternoon, you're going to go sailing right by it. It's only maybe about a half hour to 45 minutes down the river. But as luck would have it, by the time we got there, it was dark, pitch black. So this is the only picture I have of this place, and you just have to imagine that it's still there slowly decaying into ruins. Today we're going to visit the city of Strasbourg to where we go into an ancient wine cave and taste wines. What's strange about this wine cave is that it is located in the medieval basement of the city hospital. The first thing you see when you get down in this basement is rows and rows of wine barrels which are approximately six foot in diameter and maybe eight to nine foot long. They had two different types of wine set up for us plus this bread that you see here. I really don't know what it is but it was a yellow bread crusted and it had dried fruit baked in it. It was different than anything I've ever had before in my life. 
Down here at the end, under lock and key, they have this barrel of wine, which is the oldest wine in the world. This wine dates back 472 years, and it is the only wine in existence, and it cannot be reduplicated because the vines and the ground where it was growing don't exist anymore. So after leaving the winery, uh, we went to a little French restaurant which was very close by, where they served us the specialty faux gras, which is pate, or in this particular case, goose liver and duck liver. And they both taste quite different from each other. And it was really quite a, an adventure. And you know, we had more wine to drink along with this that you can imagine. And that was, I could say is when time I get to the ship, it was Happy New Year. The next afternoon, we went out into the Alsace-Lorraine to see something very, very special. A stork sitting on her nest. And there she is. The people out here are very careful about their storks. They love their storks, but they don't want to be smoked out of their houses. So therefore, they build wire cages on top of their chimneys for the storks to build their nest, period. As we leave the storks nest, we wander down the streets to see the rest of the village and all its beautiful decor. You can see that these people love to paint their buildings very bright, lively colors, which really makes a good impression. And here is an interesting, surprising feature, a string of corn cobs hanging out to dry. And we round the corner and find an outdoor cafe. And we have a nice beautiful hotel over here. And looking down the side alleys here, there's a nice interesting shot of that building. And then what's next? Pat sitting there drinking. What is it when you're drinking? Wine or what? Oh no, I got something better. What? Ice cream. Oh. The end of a perfect day. Great. We arrived in Luzer Lake Luzerne early in the morning. And the first thing that we were going to do is go for a boat ride and then looking at the lake. And there's Pat admiring the lake before we, while we're sailing around the place there. Now you can see that there's still a lot of snow on these mountains. And you know what? By the time the snow melts, it starts to snow all over again. We're now coming into port and these are some of the beautiful buildings that we're seeing as we're dock, coming into dock. You can admit, it's really quite a sight. There is a very long and elaborate wooden walkway into town. And as we walk along the walkway, we can see these beer buildings here on the shore, which are nothing more than restaurants, one after another. I noticed this very fancy elaborate the building up on the hill here, which I thought maybe might have been a castle, but no, it was a hotel. And as we walk along the town, we notice quite a variety of different style of buildings. These buildings that we're going to see are very elaborately decorated. And now all coming up over here, it's a very fancy roof that's a little different than anything else we have seen so far. Now this is a very interesting building with this thing on. And this one also, very interesting paintings on it. Now, at the base of this building, there's a, new, a little outdoor cafe, which Pat and I decided to have a nice little simple lunch, which we did. But you know what? It has outrageous prices. This simple little lunch had the outrageous price of $62. If you find these prices outrageous, don't go to Switzerland.
day is almost over. Oh, and it went by so quickly. All 14 days were wonderful. Yeah. And what were some of your favorite moments of this gorgeous party? Well, I have two very favorite, maybe three, and the rest are all very good also. The trip to, to Omni Moselle, to Cochem, the village of Cochem, and the castle. Yes, that was very nice. I know you've seen it in that previous trip, but that was my first thing there. Now, I really enjoyed that. That I was nice. I remember it well from both trips, and I was looking forward to seeing it the second time. Another thing that re I really enjoyed was the trip into the Alsace Lorraine, where you see the storks in the stork nest, and the very interesting village. Yes, that it was an interesting village. And I know I've heard of storks, I've seen them on these um, videos on TV, but I, that's the first one I've ever seen up close and personal alive. Well, the way they love their storks. Yeah. The last thing that I really stuck, up, you know, stuck out in my mind is up, while we were out on Lake Lucerne, on the water, we saw the magnificent Alps and the clouds behind them. Yes, very, very nice. Well, you know, Pat, I also enjoyed on the ship this piano player over here that played for us every night. Oh, yes. And some of the local talent in different stops that he brought in. They were very, very good. Yes, yes. I did. The whole trip was just a very much of a pleasure. And also for me, being back in my 65 years later, brought back a lot of other memories in that lucky I, I'm sure it did. <laughs> well, you know what, I, I think it's time that we say goodbye to these people. So, shall we? Goodbye. Uh,